Good morning, everyone. Very good. Good morning. It is so good to see all of you here with us in person. Uh, what a joy it is that we have to gather uh, this day, and especially those of you at home as well. So glad that you can be here to join us on Zoom or on YouTube. Uh, love seeing all of your smiling faces. If you haven't started your video yet and are willing to do so, we would love if you would, just so that we can uh, see you and know that you're there. We, we miss so many of you so terribly. So please, uh, if you're willing to do so, uh, start your videos now. Uh, just a reminder that, of course, we are continuing in this uh, strange time of pandemic here uh, in Hitchcock and in the world, uh, and we want to be careful with one another. As you've all seen in the news recently, our numbers are spiking all over the country, uh, which means that we are in that, what do you want to call it, second or third wave, whichever you want to call it, uh, that we have been dreading a bit uh, for several months now. So I just want to kind of remind everyone that as we sing together, we're doing it very muted and to ourselves, maybe even inaudibly uh, to those who are around you. Uh, keep distance, of course, and then when we are outside, even though we are outside, please uh, keep your distance and keep your masks on so that we can be uh, careful with one another and care for one another. Uh, thankful that we have singers here with us today. We have missed uh, our singers a little bit, so it is so good to, to see the two of you here, uh, and we are joyful for that. A couple of concerns, and then we have a special uh, thing happening in just a second. The first being uh, that Hay Park's mother is in the hospital, and so we want to continue to keep uh, her in our prayers right now, uh, as well as so young as she goes through a difficult time at the moment as well. So please keep the Park family all in your prayers at the moment. Uh, and then June Branch, we continue to pray for June each and every day. Uh, she is such a special part of this community. Uh, she gave me a phone call this week uh, and expressed just incredible gratitude to all of you who have reached out to her in one way or another. She is feeling the Hitchcock love these days. Uh, and so let us continue to keep June in our prayers this day as well. Uh, the special thing that is about to happen is we have a breakfast run happening right now. So there are people in the city uh, who are feeding our brothers and sisters in need at the moment. Uh, Tracy Sai was going to call in, but another concern to share with you, she was on the run and then got a phone call that her dog had just passed away. So Tracy has gone home to be with her daughters and to spend time uh, with them. Uh, please keep them in your prayers this day as well. But we have the next best thing to Tracy. We have Rudy White with us. So we are gonna try now, like, this is gonna take just a second. We are gonna unmute Rudy and we're gonna spotlight Rudy. And then I'm gonna make this TV work so that you can all hear Rudy. And he's gonna actually speak to you from the breakfast run. So hold on just one second here. Okay. I should really put on my mask, right? Yes, Hold this, my brother. <coughs> I don't know why I'm not video. <laughs> Go in, Grandma. Oh, there it is. Oh, yeah. Here, <laughs> Hello. Hi, guys. Can you hear me? Yeah, Rudy, uh, we hear you. Okay. Tell me when it's my turn. You're on, buddy. Okay, well, um, Tracy had to leave because she had a little emergency with her dog at home, but she wanted to thank PW and, and, um, and the whole congregation for all the um, monies that you guys have given us. We had a very good run today. We served over 100 people on the street breakfast, and um, it was a very successful run, so... We really appreciate everything that you guys have done. Um, I'm here with um, Stephanie. I'm here with Stan. I'm here with Ashika. Hi, everyone. I'm here with Ashika, with Darren, Hello. and and Brendan. And um, I know I don't I don't want to keep keep you guys too long, but I also just want to use this up take this opportunity to thank Stan who has been, is a member of Hitchcock and has been a member of the um, Midnight Run for the last 20 years. And uh, he is leaving, he's moving to Florida. Um, it's one of those uh, crazy situations where 
Um, we get good people, but we lose them. But we are really grateful for all that he has done for the Midnight Run over these years. I just want Stan to just give you a quick note. I don't want to take too much of your time, but just a quick note of how he came to Midnight Run and um, just to say um, goodbye. Thank you, Hitchcock. It's uh, with a heavy heart that my wife Karen and I have decided to move south to Florida. I have to say that one of the things that I, I love the most about Hitchcock is how Hitchcock gives itself, gives of itself to the community, especially manifested in Midnight Run. We come out once a month and have an impact on the lives of so many people. And they always ask where we're from. We say Hitchcock. They know who Hitchcock is. They know what we're all about. And uh, all the support that the church gives constantly throughout the year to hit to Midnight Run and to support us and what we do is just uh, words can't say how much it matters. And I, I know I'm going to be missing not only Hitchcock, but I'm going to miss Midnight Run and my friends that uh, have been a part of my life for 20 years. And I'm just going to it's going to be it's going to be really sorry. I'll be really sorry to see it all go. But, but um, oh, Rudy wants me to share one quick story. The quick story is how I learned about Midnight Run. 20 years ago, we were just, we became new members of the church. We had come to a Sunday service and we, I looked at the brochure, the bulletin and it said midnight run. And I told, I turned to Karen and I said, Oh, the church has a running team. <laughs> and then as we walked out of the church, the, the minister at the time, the pastor was Don Steele. And I turned, I asked him, I said, well, thanks so much for the service. So I loved your sermon. Can you tell me, is the midnight run, is it a 5K or a 10K run? He had no clue what I was talking about. Then he realized I did, I was confused. I didn't know what midnight run was all about. And then he explained it and then came down, had the, the time of my life, that first midnight run. And that was 20 years ago. And we've been doing it ever since. So thank you very much, Hitchcock. Thank you for all that you do. And, and thanks so much for the leadership that we received from Rudy White. This would not work without Rudy White. And all that he does is, uh, is just beyond words in terms of the uh, generosity. But uh, I'm going to hand it back to Rudy real quick. So Hitchcock, thank you very much. I'm without my mask for just one second. Thank you very much. And we appreciate all the support that you give to this mission. And uh, we try to represent you guys uh, the best way we can when we come out on the street. Thank you very much and have a great service and a good day. Bye-bye. Okay. Wow. Wow. Stan, Stan and his wife, they're going to be missed greatly here at Hitchcock, especially at Midnight Run. And we are so grateful for all of you for the gifts that you have given to Midnight Run over the last couple of weeks so that we can continue in this mission together. With that, I'd ask you all to please rise and let us join together in our call to worship. Lift up your hearts. Lift up your voices. Lift up your songs of thanksgiving and praise. Come, let us worship the Lord. Lift up your hearts.
Please be seated. <clears throat> I'm sure all of you know, as a parent or an aunt or an uncle, when a child has done something unkind to you or done something they should not have done, the offense is even less important than their willingness to come to terms with it and simply say they're sorry. I think God is like that at times. So I invite you to join me in this prayer of confession as a way of saying we're sorry and we'll try not to do it again. It'll be followed by a period of silent prayer. Let us pray together. Almighty and everlasting God, you are always more ready to hear than we to pray and to give more than we either desire or deserve. Pour upon us the abundance of your mercy. Forgive us those things of which our conscience is afraid and give us the good things for which we are not worthy to ask, except through the merits and meditation of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. The scriptures assure us that if we ask for forgiveness, God is more than willing to do so. So I declare to you in the name of the risen Christ, we are forgiven. The peace of Christ be with you. Let's make sure the people at home hear us. The peace of Christ be with you. Please greet those around you with words of peace. Diane, say hello. Oh, there's a rope there. Right. Yeah. Right. Peace, everybody. Peace, everybody. <laughs> say peace. Peace. Peace of Christ. Oh, there's Gail. See everybody. It's great to see everyone. Peace of Christ be with you all. It is so good to see everybody. Here, hold on, Catherine. Did you say peace? There's Catherine. Peace, everybody. Peace. I just you did it up there. Peace. Okay. Peace. All right. Very good. Peace, everybody. All right. We are going to meet every, mute everybody again so that we can continue with our worship service. But peace be with you all. Apparently I'm unmuted. Thank you, Jan. That's very helpful. Once more, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. 
Again, he sent other slaves saying, tell those who have been invited, look, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they made light of it and went away, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his slaves, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burned their city. Then he said to his slaves, the wedding is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore into the main streets and invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing a wedding robe. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, find him hand and foot and throw him out in the inner darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Seminary was kind of a blur for me, honestly. Working a full-time job and children at home. There's not a lot I remember actually from seminary. Most of what you figure out in ministry, you figure out as you go along, not really what you learn. But there is one class that I remember very well and it was my preaching class. In seminary, they call it homiletics, but it's really just a fancy word for preaching. Anyway, the final of that class, I remember, was to write a sermon on an assigned text and then to preach that sermon to the class and to the professor while they all took notes on what you said. At the time, I thought that there was nothing more intimidating than preaching in front of a homiletics professor of all people while he occasionally, while nodding, would look down and make some notes on his paper uh, which had you sweating even more than I usually do. But I assure you that the real thing is actually much more intimidating than that. Anyway, that entire year, that entire class that year was assigned the very same text, and it's the text that you just heard Catherine read from Matthew chapter 22, verses 1 through 14. I don't remember the grade that I got on the final, but I do remember hating that text. I remember that it was such a problem for me. The parable of the wedding banquet. I watched as student after student twisted themselves into oratorical knots, trying to get the scripture to not say what it so clearly said. And here I am judging them, but I'm sure that I did the same thing that year. Because Presbyterian ministers are really comfortable preaching about the grace of God, about the table being set, about the invitation being given. But we tend to shy away when the scriptures speak of the wrath of God. When it exists in the Hebrew scriptures, we dismiss it as ancient understandings of the God of the Old Testament. In other words, we claim that wrath is pre-Jesus. Or when we find wrath in the letters of Paul, we say, oh, that's just that crazy Paul, and he's at it again. And of course, we dismiss the book of Revelation altogether. A vengeful, wrath-filled, angry God is not the God that we know. It is certainly not the God of our children's sermons. It is not the God of Jesus loves me, this I know, and not the God of amazing grace. This parable is difficult for us 
because in it, Jesus is the one speaking, and it highlights both the grace of God and the wrath of God existing in tension with one another. It starts out the way that many of the parables start out. The kingdom of God may be compared to. And so we know that this story that Jesus is about to tell is going to be an allegory for the kingdom of God, present and future. The kingdom of God may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. The king sends out servants to those who have been invited, to those who have been chosen for the high honor of attending the wedding banquet of the king's own son. But they refuse to come. No reason is given for this. They just don't come. In an act of grace, grace, the king sends other servants to try again to try to entice the people to come this time. He tells the servants to remind the people that the dinner is ready, that the animals have all been slaughtered for the feast. But again, the people refuse to come. Verse 5 says, But they made light of it and went away, one to his farm and one to his business. In other words, they were too busy to come to the wedding banquet, had too many things on the to-do list to take pause, to go and celebrate the son of the king. But others went even further than that. It says that they seized the servants, that they mistreated them, and that they killed them. In the allegory that is this story, we might imagine that those servants are the prophets of the Old Testament who had gone to the people over and over and over again to invite them to be in relationship with God. Some of them were ignored. Some of them were mistreated. And some of them were killed. And so after the grace of sending the second invitation, the king becomes enraged. And verse 7 says, he sent his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burned the city. That, of course, is God's wrath in the allegory. But the parable doesn't end there. You see, the table is still set, and so there is still good news to come. The banquet is still prepared. So the king tells the servants to go out into the streets and to gather in and invite anyone that they can find, both the good and the bad, it says. For the banquet is no longer limited to those who had been chosen, but now is open to all people, both good and bad. It no longer depends upon faith or ethnicity or stature in the community. Rather, the banquet becomes the hall of sinners and of saints. Reminds us of the church, doesn't it? A hall of sinners and of saints. And there's God's grace again. Rather than canceling the banquet altogether, rather than abandoning humanity, which certainly deserved to be abandoned at this point, rather God continues to extend the invitation, continues to speak, to seek guests for the banquet and for the kingdom. And it says that the hall was filled with guests. Now, everyone in my homiletics class would have been very, very pleased if the parable had just ended right there. We have seen God's grace several times throughout the story, and yes, we saw God's wrath as well, but that wrath was for other people. That wasn't for you and me. We have accepted the invitation. We have filled the hall, either virtually or in person. We are here. We have shown up. We have heard God's invitation, and we have said yes. But of course, the parable isn't over yet. And this is the part that most every preacher that year in homiletics class decided to just kind of ignore. Verse 11 says, but then the king came in to see the guests. He noticed a man not wearing a wedding robe and the king questioned the man. And then had his servants bind the man hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And just like that, we are back to God's wrath 
again. But not for other people, not for those who long ago mistreated the prophets of God, but rather for one of us or for many of us who have accepted the call but have shown up unprepared. In the biblical commentaries, there are lots and lots of writings about this garment that the man is supposed to be wearing and what it really represents and the custom of if you have a banquet at that time and someone shows up without a robe, then it is customary for you to offer that person a robe. And so people have conjectured that this man refused the invitation yet again by not wearing the robe. But still, what does it represent? An unpreparedness in the presence of God. The king's wrath is once again on full display for all to see. And the reason that this text was assigned in homiletics class is because it forces young, idealistic, wannabe preachers to wrestle with the wrath of God and hold it in direct tension with the grace of God. Invitation sent twice, that's grace. The people destroyed, that's wrath. The invitation extended to all the people, to the masses, that is God's grace. The man cast into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, that is God's wrath. And then that parable ends with the famous line, many are called, but few are chosen. What are we to do with a text like this? It's not the first time where Jesus tells a story like this. In fact, it was on the sermon of, in the Sermon of the Mount where Jesus gives us the beauty of the Beatitudes that Jesus also says of false prophets, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. The temptation is to ignore texts like these to choose a different text when it happens to pop up on a lectionary, to dismiss it as a sign of the times. But to do so is a risky venture because it risks us responding to the invitation from the king the same way those did that just didn't take it seriously. Or it risks us showing up unprepared for what God is calling us to be and to do. Proverbs 9 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And so the question is really this, this morning, and this is what I want us all to think about a little bit this week. The question is this, in our attempt to be nice Christians, to differentiate ourselves from those who seem to preach only wrath with very little grace, in our attempt to be nice in the world, have we so lost the fear of God that we ignore God's invitations without pause? In our attempt to highlight the grace of God, have we in fact turned the amazing grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ into what Bonhoeffer called cheap grace? Cheap grace is defined this way by Bonhoeffer. Cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance. Baptism without church discipline, communion without confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship, grace without the cross, grace without Jesus Christ. In our world, we see a lot of people crying out, Lord, Lord. In our nation, 10 days from a presidential election, faith continues to be a buzzword. But what is connected to that faith? What actions are connected? Over 500 children on our southern border, now orphans because of crimes against humanity committed by us. Committed by us. I've often uttered the words over the last few years just to myself, how do these people sleep at night? It is those who cry, Lord, Lord, but show up unprepared, not clothed in righteousness, but rather clothed in hatred and bigotry and dishonesty and an appalling lack of empathy for whom the fear of the Lord is lacking. 
The end of that verse from earlier in Matthew that I started is actually very helpful, so let me give it to you. It says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. Those out on the breakfast run this morning, they are worshiping right now just as much as we are. Those who gave donations so that even during this difficult time, Hitchcock can continue to be there for those who are in desperate need on the streets of New York City, they put on the garment as they gave of themselves. Those who have made phone calls and written cards to June Branch in the past few weeks for which she is so grateful have put on the garment of God. Those who wear a mask out of compassion for other people, out of love for their neighbor, rather than not wearing a mask out of selfishness, have put on the garments of God this year. And those who have stood in long lines in the rain to cast their vote early with hope in their hearts, seeking the kingdom of God, they have put on the garments of the banquet these days. In so many ways, you have shown up for one another and for this world during these difficult days. And I am so proud of the way that Hitchcock has weathered this storm. But friends, there is a long way still for us to go. And there are so many who are still in so much need. It is important for us to hold together in tension both the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and also the wrath of our God to continue to be in awe and wonder in the presence of our Lord, to remove the sandals from our feet when we are on holy ground, and to bow down in adoration at the awesome splendor of our God. And yes, it is important to occasionally be filled up with the fear of God. That we might choose a path of wisdom, compassion, empathy, and grace. It is true that God is filled with mercy and unconditional love. But Galatians 6, 7 reminds us, do not be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant. Not all those who cry, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. For friends, many are called, but few are chosen. Amen. Will you stand with me, please, and let us affirm our faith together a portion of a brief statement of faith. Let us say together, we believe that in life and in death we belong to God. Through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit, we trust in the one triune God, the Holy One of Israel, whom alone we worship and serve, with believers in every time and place. We rejoice that nothing in life or in death can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. The story is told about the cow and the pig that were having a conversation and the pig said, I don't, I don't understand this. Every time the children from school come to visit, all they do is want to be with you. And all you do is give them milk. I give them pork and bacon and fried pork rinds and on and on and on. All these things. Why? Why did the children avoid me? And the cow said, well, I do my giving while I'm living. I invite you. <laughs> it was an effort. <laughs> I invite you to do the same as the ushers come forward. Oh, worship. 
Thank <laughs> you.
Friends, let us pray. Good and gracious God, we recognize on this crisp, beautiful fall morning that we have much to be grateful for. We are thankful for the reminder of your presence and creation through the beauty of the trees and the paths we walk on in these days. We are reminded of the generosity and compassion of this community and all that we do for our friends who are unhoused and homeless. And we were reminded of your grace and love for us, even if that grace is not cheap. And we are grateful that we can receive that grace and learn to respond to others with grace and mercy as well. But Lord, we are also filled with a sense of creeping anxiety. We live in a world with much pain and grief and sadness. We mourn the deaths of over 212,000 of our brothers and sisters and friends in this country who have passed away from the coronavirus. And for many more who have become ill and who continue to suffer from its effects long after the illness on paper is gone. Lord, we also mourn and share your rage and your judgment against the systemic racism in this country that continues to kill as surely as this virus does, taking the lives of so many before they can continue to do their work and be a light a soul, and the world doing your work for others, with others. We mourn with them, with their families, and we feel your rage burning hot against the injustice that continues in this country. Lord, we also know that you are enraged at the plague of discrimination against our brothers who exist on the other side of our borders. We ask that you liberate us from the xenophobia, from the judgment of those who do not look as we look like us or speak like us or come from the kind of privilege we do. We feel your rage burning hot, Lord, against those who would put children in cages and rip them from their mother's arms. Lord, in all of this, we also mourn our own deaths, have our own anxieties, are dealing with our own pain and suffering. In small ways, trying to figure out how to homeschool our children and deal with problems on Zoom and technology day after day, how to work from home, live from home, learn from home. We share the suffering of those who are hungry in these days because the economy is not what it was. Lord, we are feeling the pain of those who are without work, without the dignity that it brings and the security it brings, and in a country where health insurance is not guaranteed with the life that it brings. Lord, we know that you love us. We know that you offer us grace, but also teach us to be wary of your judgment when we act with injustice, or worse, or just as bad when we turn away from it and decide that it is none of our business. Lord, help us to not only be called and chosen, but to respond to that call and to that chosenness with the grace and mercy you show us, to act with mercy to act with love and to go out in the world and to actually respond to the injustices and pain and sadness and grief and desperation and dispossession that we see and not just meet it with empty words and empty prayers. Help us to become the community, the families, the individuals, regardless of our age or our gender or our sexual orientation or our race that you call us to be so that we can be that beloved community of love that you envisioned for us and call us 
no matter what happens in the world to every single day. Lord, we ask all of these things in your name and the name of your son who taught us to pray in this way, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <laughs> Friends, following the postlude this morning, I will be joining those who are on our Zoom call this morning in coffee hour, and Catherine will come outside and greet each of you on the patio. Again, I remind you to, to keep socially distanced, to keep those masks on, and let's continue to love one another in the way that we do best here at Hitchcock. My friends, I commit you all now to the mercy, to the power, to the faithfulness of the eternal Lord our God. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, and the communion of all the saints be with you this day and forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated.
right. Good morning, everybody. It's 